So, yeah, that's the best part of, of what we're talking about, the practicality and transfer of training. So as I was just mentioning, we, we started to get into this thing around money and uh, had a request to get more into talking about that. Money, finances, investment. You've got a, a watch in <coughs> Okay. Oh. I, had a, I had a whole... Swarm of bees one time, you did a halo over there. And I was outdoors, so you did a talk. Excuse me. <laughs> so, uh, I thought we could talk about it, and then it dawned on me that uh, that, that was part of Francis's journey that a financial manager, planner. a financial planner, and she had her own company eventually. So, that shows you, you know, where. Is what you may develop in terms of the world, then, then what happens, practically speaking, when the Holy Spirit and, and Jesus, or your intuition, takes over as far as guiding you? And, and that's what makes it so fascinating, because that is really a good question about investments. He was sharing, what's your name again? John. John. John was sharing with me during the break that, that he's had a lot of money through investments that he's lost, where people have kind of absconded, have just gone off uh, with the money, and not just for him, but for lots of people. Uh, there's all kinds of different seeming scams in the world where you invest in something, and then not only isn't there maybe the return you expected, but but your principal, everything. They, people just kind of go off with things. And that's, that's almost like another version of the idea of the people owe you money. This is, is where you invest in something. John invested in things that seem very good hearted even. Investing in putting solar panels on, on schools. You know, it's not like investing in defense spending, bombs and, and AK, and, you know, grenades and guns and everything. He's investing putting solar panels on schools, or was it wind turbine, you know, using alternate energy other than coal and typical things, and then, what was the third one? Converting um, waste into energy. Converting waste into energy. Those seem to be actually really good things, generally, to invest in, and then having the money just taken. And so, I thought we could tie that into the idea, too, of self-concept and because that was with you being financial planner and, and actually financial planners are paid, she had her own company, to invest wisely. So let, maybe we can start to explore from your experiences, what, what does it mean to invest wisely? Because if you follow the, the rules of the world and you invest wisely according to what the world would say is wise, uh, we hear stories every day about pensions being stolen after years and decades of being put into, and we hear stories of unfair treatment, of victimization, of people absconding with money and so on and so forth. It must mean that we need to go really deeper in, around this idea of investment and start to really look at what an investment is. What is an investment? What does it mean to loan money or lend money? Uh, and like John was saying, it's, it's been there's working through anger, like you mentioned with going there at the bank, working through anger with it and then getting to maybe partial states of not caring anymore, maybe kind of throwing in the towel like, ah, it's just too much mind energy to put into that, but there's still something, like it may come back, but probably not. So I thought because of your background in, in that, maybe we would start looking at, at the whole idea of investment. Because I think all of us, would, whenever we think of investment, we certainly think of investing wisely. We put those words together. And uh, what is it for? What is the purpose of 
of the investment. Maybe we need to go deeper into the very idea of investments to look at what is the purpose. And you've gone through through that. Kind of a fear of the future, isn't it? Fear that we may not have enough in the future, so we're trying to protect ourselves against. Okay, that's good. You're bringing so it, it can it can have a time component, a future component too. I would say too, investing. When I say what is it for, let me get into the question of valuing. Like, what is an investment? Mm -hmm. Sometimes we talk about an investment of time, for example. Anybody who's ever been a parent, you know, could say with, with children, they're an investment of time. Before you don't have them, then you have them, and there's the use of time seems to go in a different way, you know, after children. But let's explore that investment idea. Yeah, I mean, I was, um, I guess, just getting into that career and myself as well is very much into investment, you know, in stock market and also uh, accumulation. Really, that was the, the, the notion behind investment is to, to get more. You know, that's different ways of trying to get more, trying to, you know, play with the market so that we can have some mechanism to establish some security. Security in portfolio, security to protect a future um, contingency, and so that we feel secure and safe, and to have more of, you know, more of safety or more of freedom that we can get through money. That was really the motivation behind it, and to get more, you know, we play this this vast concept called the market which means other people lose so that I can play the game well enough that I can get more. That is really what is happening, but we don't you know, directly relate to other people's loss. We play with the market, we beat the market so that I can get above average. So that is you know, the, the thing that I grew up with and I played with um, and also with um, real estate, I guess, you know, where I, I lived at the time in Australia, the real estate market, I was very much into looking at the market trends and how the best way to keep money and grow is to buy properties. So I bought a property as a, a resident and that's not, uh, that's not investment. I have to buy a second one purely for investment purpose. You know, to lock in the security, like one is not enough, two, eventually more, you know, that is the plan. But yeah, the experience was, there was never enough. When I got one, I feel panicked because there's no security. I need to buy the second one to feel a little more secure. It was just that kind of thing that was going on and um, yeah, actually, I was just talking with San Sandy in the break, and Sandy said, um, do you remember you came to my house and said, I'm thinking of going to David Hofmeister's monastery, and, and I said, I am so scared. And she said, um, well, you don't have to go, but you can go if you want to. And I just said, I'm so scared. And she said, she said she never saw me afterwards and it was always in her mind whether she said the right thing or not, <laughs> whether how it played out, whether I, you know, what my experience was. But I just feel good to hear that and I forgot, you know, this, how scared I was at the time. But it was an experience of having so much to lose and nothing real or tangible that I know to get. That was the kind of experience, you know, I didn't really know what I was going for tangibly, but I, I knew everything I had to lose, you know, to, by walking away from the, the, the life. So, but the interesting thing is with money, 
I have to say, I have never felt secure and peaceful. And when I had money, when I had any accumulation, I never felt less fear. The fear was consistent, and I had to keep justifying the fear is because of fear of the future loss. So I had to justify it by building up more security to protect the future loss. And not until I actually let go of the accumulation and the possession, I started to suddenly experience the peace that I had never had before. And it was only in that moment I realized the fear was never the fear about future loss. The fear actually comes with accumulating. And it's so opposite from what we were taught in this world. It was completely opposite. But that was the experience. That's the experience. You know? And that was, I guess, even with the people owning me money, I had experiences of that as well. People owning me money and um, just chose not to give back. And I had some interesting experiences. And one experience was a friend borrowed money, $1,500, and, and refused to pick up phone calls from me. And then eventually moved to Melbourne from Sydney. So I, I knew I, I couldn't pursue it anymore. But there was no peace in my mind. And what happened afterwards was I got into an accident, um, car accident, because I was just parking, reverse parking on a very uh, steep hill. I was trying to press the, the gas so hard in order to, to move forward, but I didn't realize I was on the reverse gear. So I pressed so hard and I just hit the car behind me so hard, the whole street was like, everybody stopped looking at me. And um, so I thought, okay, I left my insurance number, phone number on the other car, and the next day I came back, and I was told by the neighbors that that car was an abandoned car for years, that um, the city council always had to tow it away, and there was no consequence but my own car, um, I had to pay because I didn't have the, the full coverage. And the amount that I had to pay was the exact amount of my, how much my friend owed me, $1,500, that I had to pay the mechanic to fix my car. And it was, if everything happened, then I had to go through my insurance company and they paid the mechanic, the mechanic fixed my car and I, the insurance company couldn't find the record. I couldn't pay them. So sounds like a battery going out. So they actually wiped out the whole payment. I couldn't pay them. And the two amount was exactly the same. And I thought, you know, my dad just got wiped a few days after I dropped the pursuit of my friend. And this exact amount, I was thinking, this is not coincident. This is the spirit is teaching me, you know, is I am the one that provides you. And, you know, it's my money and I direct. And, you know, you don't worry about loss. Because I, I, I will show you. I can perform miracles, you know. And it was very, very convincing for me, that experience. Then a few years later, I got into another one, a business partner that owed me $5,000. It just didn't really communicate anymore. And I, I was already involved with the, the, the monastery, so I, I didn't know what to do. So I chose to write a letter to him, laid out all my frustration and pain and fear, and not with the intent to get the money, but just treating him as someone that can help me because of all this emotion that I was dealing with on, on a daily basis and we wanted to do that. So I wrote him this long email about 
how I was feeling and thinking and my attack thoughts. And I sent a letter to him. And we arranged a meeting later on after I left the United States and went back to Sydney. We, we arranged a meeting and we just talked and talked. He didn't really give me all the money back part of it after that, but it was an experience of what really what is that for because I was guided to, to treat it in such a way of complete transparency and sharing with someone I would not normally choose to do that. So it's just like the spirit does have a way to, <clears throat> to show the lesson, you know, and the lesson is never something that I, I know in the moment is from the egoic mind. So, yeah, I guess that's, that's what I can think of when you talk about investment and money. Yeah, yeah that's beautiful. That's beautiful. It gives us, sort of, that turning it around, like, what's the purpose in my mind? And, and that's, like, the key to turn it all around. And I think, too, for me, it's like, when you think of, like, the state of nirvana or heaven or oneness, there, there is no sense of lack, there is no sense of reciprocity, of giving to get, of gain, of loss. All the things that are tied into the earth realm are all made up by the ego. And so, uh, the ego even invents its own religion, so if you be a good boy, a good girl, then you'll get on God's favor, then you get into heaven. If you don't, you go to hell. So then you're paralyzed of do the right thing, be good, don't do the wrong thing. Then you really get interested about sin. What? Okay, what's a sin now? I'm, I'm paying attention now. What am I supposed to not do? Okay, I'll, you know, you, you have to start to really pay attention. What are the rules here? You know, it's like, reminds me of that Santa Claus song. He sees you when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. He knows if you've been bad or good, so be good for goodness sake. <laughs> Sounds like it's projected onto God. Like God is like, God is watching us. God is watching us. God is watching us from a distance. Is that supposed to be comforting? <laughs> uh, scary. <laughs> it's a bit scary, right? There's, we're being watched, and our, our all of our actions are being watched, and. We better be good, or we'll go to hell, we'll burn in eternity. You know, we, we have to go beyond that way of thinking. We don't have to think like that anymore. You know, that way of thinking is, there's a lot of guilt and fear and shame involved in that. So, an in investment, it's like, before we look at what's, what are good investments, what are bad investments, uh, I would say basically that because heaven is pure oneness, that any belief or concept or thought that involves duality in any way, shape, or form is a bad investment. <laughs> if heaven is oneness and duality is error, you wouldn't want to invest in duality. In fact, many of us were raised in religions that were dualistic. Heaven and hell, you get rewarded if you're good, do the right moral thing, and you're punished, you do the bad. There's a lot of religions, there's a lot of philosophies, there's a lot of thought systems, even modern day, new age thought systems, prosperity consciousness versus poverty consciousness. You want to get all linked into the prosperity consciousness so you can get all the goodies that come from prosperity thinking and you don't want to be in poverty consciousness because it's going to be lack. Well, who set up prosperity consciousness and poverty consciousness? You see, again, if you're even investing in that kind of model, at some point you have to begin to question that. Especially if you're going for awakening, awakening from the dream of duality. So, money is a good example. We've talked about that, how money is like supercharged, because it's just an image, it's just a concept, but it's charged with this gain and loss thing. Um, we project all kinds of things onto it. 
So it, it goes from being just nothing, just a symbol, symbol of nothing, to something that seems to be extremely meaningful. And then there's a lot of stress and expectation that are tied into giving meaning where there is no meaning. In fact, that's lesson number two from the workbook of A Course in Miracles. Jesus said, I have given everything I see, including money, all the meaning that it has for me. There's even lessons in the Course where, lesson 76, Jesus starts to poke fun at money. He says, you really believe you would starve unless you had stacks of green paper strips and piles of metal discs. Now he's going to be humorous. He's going to start poking fun at this thing. Of course, if the course was written in these day and age, we could get into little plastic <laughs> cards. You really believe you would starve without your plastic card or your plastic cards. So he is poking fun. and. He also mentions that uh, in Lesson 50 of the workbook, I am sustained by the love of God. He says, in this world you believe that you are sustained by everything but the love of God. Pills, money, protective clothing, being liked, knowing the right people. Oh, we always getting psychological. Being liked, knowing the right people. Anticipating Facebook, decades later, Jesus is talking about being liked. You see, it's all, <laughs> it's all, he's got it all covered. He's, he did it years before Facebook was even invented. He's poking fun at being liked. How many likes did you get? Does it really matter? <laughs> you know. You write a profound quote of spiritual wisdom and you put a post of a girl with a bikini on. Which one? is going to get the most likes. <laughs> you see, it, it shows the, the funniness of this world. He's poking fun at things. So with the question about investment, it comes down to, again, purpose. And when we bring in money, we could say, it's not the money itself, because the money itself is, is nothing or neutral. It's just a symbol. But what is the right use of money? So that's a good topic to go into. What's the right use of money? What's the most helpful use of money? It would have to be money, the use of money that's guided by the Holy Spirit and Jesus is the right use of money. Real simple. It's not like we don't have to have a high degree to get this. It's money that you use according to guidance that, that brings you free of guilt. It's just another mechanism, just like using the body is the ego will try to use it for its own purposes to keep you identified with it and, and guilty. And the spirit will try to use the body in a way that helps you go beyond its purpose, its meaning in this world, and, and come back to a unified awareness. It's your mind. You've never been in a body even, not once. You know, that's, he does talk about that in the Manual for Teachers. He talks about how many teachers of God does it take to save the world? One. But he qualifies it by saying, that one is not a body or in a body. So in order to wake up, you have to come to an experience that you've never been in a body. Never. Not once. Not one minute. It wasn't you. It was a dream. It was a misperception. It was a false memory. Now when we talk about investing with the Spirit then, there's a workbook lesson that says, I will step back and let him lead the way. That's a very good lesson in following the Spirit. But that has to do with your body, with your diet, with your spending money, with your use of words. Even with your use of words, that would all have to be under the same, I will spec, set, step back and let him lead the way. You see, it's going to be the guidance that will take the symbols, including money, and take your mind and unwind it from an egoic identification into above the battleground, or from a higher perspective where you just can look upon the world in softness and just see it as like a bunch of leaves dancing in the wind, with no meaning attached to anything. No sense of loss or gain. If money is just a neutral symbol, how could it be gained or lost? If it, it's like, 
I have a really good gain of nothing today. I checked the newspaper and my, my nothing lost seven points. Oh, my nothing gained four points. You know, you see, if you started putting the word nothing in place of those kind of things, it would start to get kind of comical. The gain and the loss of nothing. We're living in the land of Shakespeare or at least the name Shakespeare, if we know there are other stories behind that, but the world is what? Much ado about nothing. nothing. <laughs> We've got another prophet, along with one from Liverpool, we got it goes back a few years, much ado about nothing. He was teaching us that we put investments into images and then we get all bent out of shape about the meaning that we read into them. So, in my experience, the most helpful way of dealing with investments is starting to realize that this is a world of symbols. All of these symbols, including the stars and the planets and the people and the mountains and the oceans, it's a, it's a world of symbols. And the most important question to ask is who's in charge of the symbols? If this body is a symbol, who's the, puppet, who's the puppeteer? Or you remember the old crossbow puppeteers? Who's holding, who's holding the crossbow is the most important question. Because if the ego's running the, the body, well you know your mind's going to continue on in slavery. Because that's the whole, it's the one pulling the strings of the puppet. And that will keep the body, and really the mind, in chains, believing that it's in a body. And the spirit will use it in a different way. How do we get there? Well, we start with ideas like, in Christianity they talk about a born again experience, or they talk about giving your life over to Jesus Christ. Isn't that something we've heard in Christianity for centuries? Give your life over to Jesus Christ. Practically speaking, what could that even mean except I give over control <laughs> of the puppet, I give over control of the house, control of the children, control of everything, control of diet. In the rules for decision in A Course in Miracles, Jesus says you only have one remaining problem. You still believe that you must handle certain aspects of your life on your own. That's the only problem, of, is not giving everything over to spirit. That's the only problem. In fact, it wouldn't matter what your situation is in this world, but if you had one of those conversion experiences, I mean complete conversion of like, I resign now as my own teacher, I need to be taught by one who has, who has transcended time and space as a better teacher than my ego, to find, oh, I think maybe it's time I tune in to the way, the truth, and the life, and not try to run some aspects of my own. This is a common thing where people say, please help me out with my dating situation. Jesus, please help me with my, my, uh, my relationship with my husband or wife. Please, please. But then there'll be exceptions. Stay away from my children. <laughs> Don't you touch my children. That's mine. You're a busy guy anyway. I've got enough. I could deal with the teenagers, but still. Stay away. You know, if you do that, you're making an exception. Or you could do that with your funding, your bank account. You could have my relationships, okay, I'm generous, you can take my children, my pet, my dog, all right, take the dog too, but get out of my bank account. That's going too far. I went to Starbucks and I like to put extra cream and, you know, I don't want you fooling in my bank account. You see, if you make an exception in some aspect of your life, that's going to bring heavy consequences because if you're not giving it over to Jesus, who are you giving it to? The ego. You're letting a death wish run your mind. It's like giving over the reins. Okay, uh, Jesus, no, no, death wish. Here, I'll give you the finances, death wish, and Jesus can have the children and the house. It's almost like a divorce settlement. But you're st if you believe in the death wish and Christ, then you, you still got, you know, you can't believe in God and money. It says in the Bible, you can't believe in God and mammon. You can't push your desire for peace and put other things on the altar. 
It's got to be 100%. So that's what we're going through as a conversion experience. How does it play out in practical ways? Well, Frances has already said when she was into maintaining, accumulating, investing, there was fear. That's, that's her witness and testimony. If you invest in those kind of things, the future, making a better future, security in the future, those things, you're investing in the death wish. And you will suffer the consequences, not in reality, but in awareness of, of investing in the death wish. You get death emotions from investing in the death wish. Guilt, pain, shame, lack, depression, all of them. You get the whole bundle from investing in that way. How has it gone in my life? Well, people can say, well, yeah, if you're called to, to speak for God and be, have a teaching function and let the voice for God speak through you, I mean, you know, you can do that in your localities, but for me it went, I didn't, David did not like to travel. David was not a traveler, so this was not David's plan to go to 40 countries. I, when I first left the United States and went to Argentina, you know, people were like, wow, why did you go to Argentina? I said, oh, it, it was, I was told, I was given the instructions to go to Argentina. It really was wonderful. It opened, took blinders away from me and it's opened up many other visits to many, many different countries. But it, was, it came in a way where the, the airline tickets were given through frequent flyer miles, business class, and all kinds of things that came in that really I had nothing to do with personally. And you might say, I'm willing to serve, and then it just comes in. But it's given in a way where there's no investment. The Holy Spirit doesn't have any investment in the symbols. They're just, they're just using the symbols to undo the investment in the symbols. Using time to have you have no investment in linear time. That's how it works. Using words to take you to a place of silence and wordlessness. You see how it's, it's using them without any investment in them. Where the ego has great investment in time and words and money, it's got huge investment. So, over the years I've had lots of parables and lots of wonderful experiences, but it has always been a sense of back to listen and follow, which is what we talked about at the beginning. Trust, listen and follow. And don't question the guidance. You know, when at one point Jesus was telling me, he was saying, urban urban ministry, and I was like, urban ministry? Because I've been going around to all these countries and all these places, urban ministry. I said, what is urban ministry? Turns out what became behind urban ministry was that um, I was supposed to uh, buy a house in Mexico. I know nothing about buying houses in other countries. I don't really know how much about them in the United States, but but to buy a house in Mexico. Urban ministry, it turns out well, where he wants his house is, is very close to the second largest city in all of Mexico. There's the urban part. And a city with hundreds of Course in Miracles groups. He's getting a house near hundreds, a city with hundreds of Course, or in Cursa de Milagros actually to be more specific, it's Espanol. Which actually, the course book has sold more versions, more books in Espanol than the original English. Interesting. And so, through a series of events, I was guided, it's a whole parable and story, but even involving things that I did in the United States that all seemed to make this possible, and yet, clearly for me behind the whole thing is I'm just following instruction. Why is that important? Is because that's the purpose of everything. Is for what serves the plan of awakening. That's the only purpose that a house has, is serving the plan of awakening. It doesn't have any other purpose. It's like a symbol that's being used in the plan. And the Course in Miracles, Jesus, it says Jesus was the first one ever to accomplish his part completely in history. So, 
Therefore, Jesus is now in charge of the plan of awakening. Before, he was like all of us, discerning, listening to the Holy Spirit, going through his trials and tribulations like all of us do. But when he accepted the atonement, which means he totally reconnected with God, I and the Father are one, he is now in charge. Not he the man, but this Christ presence is in charge of the entire plan of awakening. Okay, that's the boss. You want to talk about earthly bosses? <laughs> Transfer that over. Now we've got a new boss. The boss isn't the one that pays you in this world. That's a trick. <laughs> the boss is the one who's, who's completed the plan of atonement and who knows the way back home <clears throat> to God. That's a good boss to have. Considering if you want peace of mind, you want somebody who's actually done it <laughs> to be your leader. Not somebody who's, well, maybe, I think we can pull it off. It's a good chance. I don't want that as my leader, good chance. I want an accomplished, awakened mind to be the leader. And therefore, in that sense, the Jesus says, I will perform miracles through you if you will be a willing miracle worker. And then he goes on to say, I will arrange time and space for you if you will perform miracles. Oh, now the boss is not just any old boss. Arrange time and space. Oh, 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 we've got a quantum boss now. <laughs> quantum boss. This boss can do anything. Can pull any strings. Can rearrange anything. This is where you really get into the, the glory of Jesus, truly, if this is the boss and he can arrange time and space for you, if you're willing to perform your part in the plan. So, then, that's where we get back to the investments. If he's the boss, and his word is everything, then you, you need to tune in to what the boss wants. Right? I mean, even in this world, you know, you, you're supposed to do that with, with your boss at work. But this is even more important, because it's about your peace of mind and your eternal rest as a creation of God. So in that sense, we, we learn to tune in and say, what do you want? What do you want? What do you want? We don't assume what the boss wants and then find out later the boss didn't want that. You, you pray, you ask, and in that sense, that's where your joy comes from. Your joy comes from following the boss. Because who is the boss but who you really are? It's you. It's the real you, not the imposter mess you, but the actual you, the perfect son of God, the perfect creation. So that's so beautiful because then your joy becomes in listening and following. I had people ask me that, you know, when, when this house came open and Jesus says, I want this house. It was one of those situations like, hmm, well let's check, let's check what we've got in terms of the finances for it. Well, it will just take about all of the finances <laughs> to buy this house. It's almost like you got a little table with a pile of chips. You got to put the whole, <laughs> the whole thing in. What about the furniture? Don't worry about that. I want this house. What about other things that are going on in ministry and salary? And... No. Shh. <laughs> when the boss wants the house, what do you do? You buy the house. <laughs> I had people coming up to me with, "Well, it's too tight. And it's too risky." Nobody, don't put all your money in one basket and da 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 He said, it's not my money. You don't understand. It's not my money. It's not my money. That, that is going to bring you peace of mind. It's not my money. It's not my body. It's not my house. It's not my children. Cute little cat. It's not my cat. Some of you remember the Peter Sellers movie, The Pink Panther, where he goes off on the one trip and he goes into the hotel. And Peter Sellers, you know, the Inspector Clouseau, he goes up and he's talking to the innkeeper. I think it was in Switzerland or one of them. 
Austria, and maybe Austria, and he goes up to the guy and he looks down and he sees a dog. And so Clouseau looks at the, the, the inn's owner and says, uh, does your dog bite? And the guy goes, no. So Clouseau goes down and cuts the dog. <laughs> I thought you said your dog did not bite. That is not my dog. <laughs> you see, in humor, <laughs> the man was telling the truth. That is not my dog. Are you, how willing are you to go with that? How invested are you in children and bodies and dogs and houses and clothes and cars? How invested are you in ownership? How invested are you in possession? Because the degree that your mind is invested in possession is the degree that your mind is invested in guilt and fear. To the same degree. And that's why even Jesus and the Apostles, we have St. Francis, we have a beautiful Essenes all the way through history. We can't say that this is all brand new, like, come on, that's too far, you're taking it too far, Jesus. That's too. No, we've actually had prophets, we've had avatars, we've had saints, we've had people live this out, we've had people demonstrate that to us, that love does not possess. Even the Beatles. What did the prophets, the great English prophets have to say? Always need his love. Can't buy me love. Everybody tells me so. Can't buy me love. No, 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 no. How definitive does it have to be for you, for your mind? that this is where the trust kicks in. So when we talk about investments, we, all we have to do is turn the book open to page, to workbook lesson 50, and, and have Jesus tell it to his face. You believe you are sustained by everything but love. It's like, you believe you're going against the Beatles. You're going against the Beatles. <laughs> You can't do that. You can't. This is Britain here, please. I don't care if you exit the EU or not, but please don't go against the Fab Four. They're telling you, can't buy me love. They're telling you all you need is love. They're giving it to you straight, and when you go against that and you try to take ownership, ownership of things, then that's where you're inviting the death wish. You're feeding the death wish. You know, that's the key of, of it all. It's, it's really very, very direct. Can you just expand a little bit? You said ownership and guilt. Just well, well, in heaven nothing is owned because there, there is no duality, so there's no owners and things, objects to be owned. There aren't any objects. So, so basically, ownership, possession, this is an invention of the ego. And it's a value of the ego. And to the extent that you give value to the valueless, then basically you're, you're asking for guilt, which is a very unnatural emotion. Love is very natural, but guilt is very unnatural, but it comes from misinvestment. So, so there's... So when you own things, we feel guilty? Yes. Subconsciously, there's, there's a, a great guilt underneath that. In fact, Jesus is very practical again with that, where he does come out in the, in the text and he says, um, ownership is a dangerous concept if left to you. So he's, he's saying, we're going to have to go through some mind training here. And when he says ownership is a dangerous concept, he's not saying that ownership is dangerous as a concept in and of itself. But if left to the ego, which is following you, because you believe you're separate, it's very dangerous. If left to the spirit, then it's just back to the symbols. The spirit can use the symbol to undo 
the symbol. Uses time to undo time. Uses ownership to undo ownership. You see how it's, it's sent in the right direction. So, that is really the key, is, is you see how deep it goes in terms of investments. And when your trust level goes high, you know, you can start to relax and you start to just let the spirit use the symbols. I think Wayne Dyer, before he passed away, one of his great teachings was, he said, the body and everything that we experience on earth is, is like on loan, it's like leased to us or loaned to us for the purpose of forgiveness or you, that's the only purpose that anything has is to, for, to forgive it. So it's instead of my body, my car, my house, my bank account, you might think these are like symbols that are kind of on loan for just a temporary period of time so we can undo the belief in them, undo the investment in them. So, so if you go back to your house and Mexico, if you've taken ownership of it, then one can feel guilty because you've got something that someone else hasn't got or that. But just seeing it as a symbol for a greater good, it then becomes something else. Yeah, I think that we even have symbols in this world called non-profit organizations. There are a lot of work, <laughs> seemingly, to account for everything, but that's just a symbol. It's like a stepping stone idea. And where there's no sense of personal ownership, so there's no name, a personal name on, on that house, for example, which is just a symbol. And then even that, you'd have to have a, a group of people that are integrous and trusting and following, because the whole point of it is, you might say it's Jesus' house, so he will do with that house whatever, he, whatever serves the plan. But all those symbols are just temporary symbols too. You know, they're just there and then they're, they're gone. They're all just designed to free the mind. They don't have any value in and of themselves. So as we get into this, you start to realize, wow, this is good because then it, all I want to do then is start to transfer the training. I would rather invest in peace of mind than invest in the things of the world. It starts to give you, you might say, food for thought, like, hmm, this is good. And I think that's what, kind of the way it's gone in your life with these seeming investments or divestments. And then I think probably you could, we could say that Francis is a good example of investing in qualities of mind or, or even better purpose. You've had a huge investment in purpose over these, I don't know how many years, but it's been a huge investment in purpose, which is what leads to the peace, which is really what the goal is. You know, the peace of God is the goal in this moment. Yeah, because underneath all the investment and accumulation, what was really going on was the belief that I have to, and I am sustaining myself, and I, a God or spirit will not provide for me when I need it. Basically, it's just in case, you know, there is a plan B in my mind going on without me consciously thinking about it is that I don't think you will provide for me, so I have to provide for myself and I need to build up some security to do that. And that was actually very frightening belief, you know, without me really, really realizing that at the time, it's very, very fearful belief to believe that I'm not dependent on the Spirit or God and I'm alone. It's actually a huge investment in this belief of being alone and being separate. So, so that is what is keep going on, you know, in the mind, is you invest in this belief system again and again. That's why the guilt is, is consistent and the fear is consistent. It's really because of that. And in the end, you know, what I, David said, I have invested then into purpose because then I've, I, I really feel through experience only by doing what the Spirit is guiding me can make me happy. It doesn't really matter in terms of form what he guides me to do. It's not what, 
is actually who is guiding me. You know, the what part is irrelevant. It's who is guiding me. And when I find that out, then it becomes a complete devotion into, you know, choosing the who in every moment and allow the form to be whatever. So that becomes a consistent dedication and devotion and it becomes a prayer of life to basically ask what is the most helpful for my peace of mind, which is the same as what is the best for your plan. You know, it's not what is the best for me, for Francis' future or body, Francis' financial account or anything anymore, because it's very fearful to ask for that. To ask for what is best for your plan is what is best for the whole, then in, in that there is no conflict when I ask for guidance. Because if I, if I ask for a lot of um, possession and money, and then I ask for guidance, it's really more saying, I don't really believe you. I need to sustain for myself. But what do you want me to do? So it's like a conflict in the mind going on. And our mind is so powerful. What we truly want is what we experience. So when we truly want two different things, you know, we're going to experience conflicting experiences. That's the experience. So this path is more like started to become more in congruence of what we're asking. If we ask for peace consistently, we can experience peace consistently. The only reason we don't experience peace consistently is because we, we ask for peace and pain at the same time. Or, you know, moment by moment, we choose pain, and we choose peace, we choose pain. So it's more like a training to train the mind to consistently ask for one thing, and one thing only. And this prayer of what is the best for your plan, which is my plan, what is the best for me, this becomes, you know, an experience that you don't experience any internal conflict anymore. You don't send out two conflicting prayers at the same time. And then the experience is going to be a consistent peace and happiness and safety and true security that we feel. So it's actually underneath all the, all the, you know, disguise of security and disguise of safety, there is a huge, you know, guilt, like a dynamite sitting there. So it just feels really important that we can, you know, look deeper and allow our experience to convince us what is truly worth, valuable. Do you mean that guidance is what action you can take that's not driven by fear or guilt? Even though it might be action that makes you afraid to, to go forwards, but it's the, the correct guidance because it's not driven by fear or guilt. Or if not, how do you know what's guidance and what's just to be there from the mm. Yeah. It's right, the guidance does not come from fear of consequence, it does not come from a place to protect and defend and attack. So it comes from a complete different place. It comes from Christ's mind, you know, the way. It, that's the way showing itself to you. Come on to the way so that, you know, let's completely transcend this belief. So the source of the guidance is is actually love and it's in, you know it shows up sometimes as this inspiration and sometimes it shows up as this feeling of peace a feeling of joy and there still could be fear coming after it because when we still the mind is still um, is untrained then it, the ego thoughts can still be you know grabbed onto after the initial inspiration comes to mind then we still believe in the egoic thoughts of, oh, what if? Those are the thoughts of fear of consequences, actually. So when we still believe in that, then you know, we get confused of, oh, I'm afraid. But, but truly, 
what can transcend that fear, which means what can transcend that belief onto the ego thought, is to actually follow those kind of prompts when they come. David actually was talking on the car over here that compelled is a word that that he felt all throughout the years of he felt compelled to do something. You know, sometimes it's way out of the box. But yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I was saying on the way from the ride over that that for me the Holy Spirit's voice and Jesus' voice and the, the presence of of Christ is compelling. Uh, it's a strong word. I felt uh, this is a from the parable of David, a quiet, shy guy who's like a wallflower, just wants to blend into the, the wall or something, and then all of a sudden you are mine now and, and I will use you in ways that you can't even imagine, so don't even ask. What's my five year plan? Don't ask. Don't ask. Two years? No, don't even ask. I was compelled to travel, compelled to be spoken through, compelled to be used, you know, like, use me. Uh, like the Bill Withers song, you just keep on using me until you use me up, you know. Use, use, use. That I was compelled to be used. And I'm glad I was, because <laughs> I was stagnant, I was, I was repressed, I was shy, I was all kinds of things. I, I may have thought I was meek, but Jesus said, no, meekness and strength are the same. I must not have been meek either, I wasn't meek. <laughs> I was shy and weak, is the better way to put it, you know. I needed to be worked over. <laughs> I needed a good work over, a lifetime work over to transform that. <clears throat> Moses stuttered, well, Ten Commandments, you know, step into purpose here, you got a big job to do. The thing is, is we get so accustomed to the lie, the world, the projected world is a lie, and we become adapted and, a con and accepted of the lie. So you try to just make it through life and live the best you can and deal with your problems, your new set of problems every day, and try to survive. You know, that's how human beings are trying to survive. Make it through the best they can. They don't have the big picture. So how far off is this daily human experience from the big picture? It's huge. How far off is time from eternity? Big. Is there a gap? Yeah, it's a, it's a gap. Now, how, how am I doing? Well, Jesus says, let me just give you a little uh, check for planet Earth. He says, everything in this world is backwards and upside down. Everything. That's good to know. <laughs> Especially if I'm going to start following guidance. Better be reminded that everything in this world is backwards and upside down. How, how bad is that? <laughs> Jesus, let me, give it to me straight. If it's all backwards and upside down, what are we really talking here? Well, he says, you're so confused in your sleeping state that you cannot judge your advances from your retreats. That's how deluded you are as a human being. It's all backwards and upside down. And you can't judge your gains from your losses, your advances from your retreats. Ooh, that's pretty good. Can you give me an example of that to maybe help? It kind of sounds kind of uh, warped, deluded. <laughs> Can you give me an example? Well, he says, you're so confused that you can't tell the difference, he says in the text of A Course in Miracles, you can't tell the difference between pain and joy. You cannot tell the difference between pain and joy. Wait a minute. <laughs> I think, I think, I can tell the difference between pain and joy. Jesus says, no. He told me, he said, if you could tell the difference between pain and joy, you would never experience pain again. Because you're so confused that you, you choose them both. You send up your mixed messages, your prayers, sometime for pain, sometime for joy. But you can't tell the difference, because if you could, why would you keep choosing pain? You see, it's got some good reasoning here. You can't tell the difference between pain and joy. What should that mean except, I need help. 
I can't tell the difference between pain and joy. I need big time help because my perception is really twisted and deluded. So that's, that's good. These are all things that he gives as hints about why we need to step back and let him lead the way. He says at one point, if there's a teacher within you that knows the way back to heaven, it would be unwise for you to not follow that teacher. It's a double, kind of double negative. In other words, follow the one who has transcended pain and suffering. That's a good teacher. Don't follow the one that's trying to tempt you into more guilt and pain and suffering. That's, that, he, Jesus says, the ego is a particularly poor teacher. Particularly poor. <clears throat> so let's get practical again. Let's bring it back to money and finances. Because there's a lot of teachers out there that are talking about abundance. And if you follow the Holy Spirit and Jesus, you will have an abundant life. We have in the United States mega ministries, massive ministries of people following these mega teachers and mega churches that are promising if you follow Jesus and the Holy Spirit, you will receive favor, God's favor and God's abundance. Well, there's, you can see why they're so big. I could barely get 15 or 20 people in this place. But the mega churches, there's, we're talking huge thousands and thousands and thousands. So then I would ask the question, let's look at abundance. What is abundance? Jesus' definition, happiness, joy, peace of mind, freedom. That's Jesus Christ's definition of abundance. It's an attitude, it's a state of mind. When you're happy and joyful, are you concerned about anything? No, you're swept up in the joy and in the happiness. You don't have a care in the world because you are truly abundant. And then poverty, let's look at poverty. Is this the thing that everyone's so afraid of that they have to have insurance policies and better investments and stronger this and stronger that? What if poverty is not a material condition, but what if poverty is a state of mind too? What if sadness, depression, shame, guilt, fear, what if those are poverty? You see, Jesus is defining everything in terms of what is your state of mind right now. So, it's really a good litmus test about whether you're abundant or whether you're poor, is how am I feeling? In fact, he even says in the Course, that's the one right use of judgment. How do you feel? When Jesus Christ uses words like one right use of judgment, it must be important. How do I feel is my barometer, is my litmus test on, on how abundant do I accept, how worthy of the true abundance am I, or how unworthy to feel so unlike a child of God, afraid, shameful, guilty. So really what he's doing is he's saying, all we have to do is we have to take a look at every single thought and belief in your mind. And if you have false thoughts, we'll say of abundance and poverty, then we need to clear that up. We need to change change your mind on those definitions. Come into alignment with Christ on His definitions. Like meekness and weakness. I, I a lot of people on the planet, humans think the, those that are meek are, are the weak. You know, we may think of the animal kingdom and we, we see like a, a lamb is kind of, lambs are kind of meek. They're kind of meek as far as animals go. And a lion, ah, roaring, ah, big lion. Meek, strong, king, the lion king. <laughs> There's, why do they call it the lion king? Because they're strong, they're big. You don't mess with lions. It's like, uh, most all creatures stay away from lions. They don't want an angry lion. It could be they turn into lunch they do that. So, we have to realize that meekness and strength are actually the same. Some of you remember the Bible, the lion and the lamb. 
shall lie side by side. Remember that from the Bible? All he was teaching was strength and meekness shall lie side by side are the same. Next time you contemplate a lawsuit, remember, the lion and the lamb shall lie side by side. The strength comes in meekness. The strength comes in defenselessness. The strength comes in identifying the spirit. Jesus was a very meek teacher, you know, especially when it came to the cross. You don't see Jesus up on the cross fighting to get loose, fighting the Romans, you know, get these spikes out of me and put me down, I am the Lord, you know. No, he was, he was very meek. Because why? Because he wasn't a body. He wasn't, Christ is not male or female. Christ is not masculine or feminine. Christ is Christ. Christ is pure spirit. I and the Father are one. Spirit, spirit. And if you're identified with spirit, what consequence can there be? What does perception have to do with spirit? Nothing. You know, he was identified with, purely with spirit, and therefore he was defenseless. They brought false charges against him. They said he was stirring up, you know, riots and uprisings and all these false charges that came against him. But he did not respond. He did not defend. Basically, everything that he taught for three years was was what he was teaching. That was what he, you know, pay attention to what I just showed you and demonstrated. I don't need to make a big fuss at the end when you're trying to hang me on a cross because I've spent three years demonstrating how our Heavenly Father really is. How the essence of Spirit really is. I don't need to say anything more. And plus it was a great demonstration. You can't, can't kill the Christ. It was a little skit at the end. Put it in a tomb and then roll the tomb away and come up and you know, make some appearances. That was a nice kind of a skit at the end, but it's, it's a, there's a big lesson behind the skit that you can't kill the Son of God. It was, you know, it was a tiny little thing for a giant lesson that, that the Son of God is spirit, that, that God is a spiritual God and Christ is the spiritual creation of God. That's what the whole thing was meant to teach. So, you know, it's really beautiful in that way. So I think, this is great, come to England, the, the land of Brexit, to really get at this, <laughs> let's really get at this financial and investment. And, yeah. yeah the, what kind of past you? Is, um, not if since everything, since everything is upside down and backwards, so the mind is so closed and in total darkness. How do you um, how do you find how do you distinguish whether you're doing something out of the fear is intense, obviously. How do you distinguish whether you're doing the emotional bypass or you're actually following Christ's guidance? Yeah. The, the actual way to discern and distinguish is, is from like a sense of self-honesty. Again, like Jesus said, the one right use of judgment is how do I feel? If you go from step to step of upliftment, of feeling a lightness, a, light, a happy lightheartedness, a, an actual joy, if you start to experience glee, I love the word glee, it's just so alive and vibrant. If you go from glee gleeful experience, to gleeful experience, to gleeful experience, that's a good uh, barometer that you're following the Spirit. It has to be a gleeful journey. It can't be, woe, woe is me, and, you know, the sense of victim, and, and the world's against me, and, you know, which is much, mostly what human beings experience. A lot of humans go through lots, so much darkness, so much intense, like shaking you to your roots darkness that you might get a glimmer of joy here or there but 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 for me it's been a gleeful journey the glee has taken me in the glee is compelling you know you want me out of darkness you're going to have to convince me that I'm light well here I'll knock your socks off is what <laughs> it's, 
still to this day, <laughs> I will knock your socks off kind of glee, you know, here, try this. Well, okay. And then you have some miracles, some more miracles, some glee, 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 and you go, whoa, this is really great. You ain't seen nothing yet. Bum, bum. So the baby, you just ain't seen nothing yet. Bum, bum. Here's something that you're never going to forget. Bum, bum. Come on. Bring it on, you know, bring me the light and joy. Really convince me, really get me immersed in the miracles. Make it so I have no shadow of doubt that the ego is not real. Not that I, I wonder if the world's real, not that I even go around and say that the world's unreal. Jesus didn't. Look at three years on the planet Earth 2,000 years ago, he never went around telling people publicly that the world wasn't real. In fact, we find out later in the Gospel of Thomas that he, he kind of gets Thomas to the side and just between him, him and Thomas, you know, he says, don't, don't tell anybody this or it will bring fire down on our heads. A little bit different than typical Course in Miracles students who go running out to their mother and their aunt. Aunt, Aunt Frida, the world's not real. If Jesus didn't do it, why are you telling Aunt Frida <laughs> that the world isn't real? What business do you have telling Aunt Frida the world isn't real? Do you believe it? Since it's in the book. <laughs> well, so, so Jesus told Thomas, don't tell anybody this or it will bring fire down on their heads. You can imagine 2,000 years ago somebody going around telling people, Romans and everybody in the world is not real. So, we're here to demonstrate, that we're here to demonstrate by our joy, by our happiness, by our consistent happiness, that the Kingdom of Heaven lives. You know, teach not that I died, teach that I live in you. Not by going around telling people that the world isn't real, but by living in the joy of Heaven. So, to me, that's where the authentic thing comes in. You know, there was a teacher who talked about bliss ninnies. And don't be a bliss ninny. And a, don't be a bliss ninny. Don't pretend to be blissful. You know, it, don't pretend at anything. If, if you're blissful, shine your light and be that blissful representation of God that you are. If you really come in contact through forgiveness with your joy and your glee and your happiness, then be that way. I went to a major Course in Miracles conference years ago, and the organizer was like, he was doing a Sunday sermon, there's 500 people there, and he starts off with his sermon, don't you hate it, don't you hate happy people? He starts <laughs> off, and I'm like, I'm looking around because I'm thinking, this is the Course in Miracles, don't you hate happy people, don't you hate those people that are just happy all the time? Before long there was people around looking at me. In, I was just sitting in the audience, just everything. the whole sermon was, don't you hate, and it was all about, you know, I lost money in the financial crisis, and I have, I have all the pains and hurts and everything, let's be real, he was saying, that, that there's, there is loss, and da 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 da, and, 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 you know, I would say, forgive and be happy, and authentically forgive, you have to actually do the work. Like Byron, Byron Katie says, you have to do the work, you have to turn it around. Maybe you have to turn it around five million times or a, a billion times or something, but you have to keep turning it around until you don't have to turn it around anymore, until you're, you realize that you're an effect of God, and that God is the cause. And the but world... Also to facilitate that though is to feel the anger, yes. or upset, yes. or loss, or pain, exactly. or tears. You have to be, to be able to do that, oh, yeah. so that you get out of denial. Yeah, you have to feel it. You have to feel it. You have to, uh, you actually have to welcome it into yeah. awareness. Yeah. There's no bonus points, you don't get any bonus points for the length of time that you feel it. In other words, it's only being brought into awareness so that you can let it go. You don't, like, feel it. Uh, I felt it for ten seconds. Oh, I felt it for two years. Woe is me, I felt it for twenty years ago. You don't get any bonus points for suffering. <laughs> I was like, okay, alright, I could have handled, well, how about one second? It's good for me, give it over to the Holy Spirit. You know, feel it fully and give it away <laughs> to the Holy Spirit. There's no bonus for length of time. But, you can't, 
deny it. You can't push it out of awareness. It will not heal if it's out of awareness. So to me, that, that's another thing. It's like our communities. You know, I remember I asked Jesus for some practical guidance with, with human beings and relationships and living together. And, and, and he said, well, we're not going to do a monastery with traditional vows, poverty, chastity, obedience, you know, the traditional ones. We're going to do two guidelines. Not vows, just guidelines. No people pleasing is your first guideline and no private thoughts is your second guideline. In other words, just encourage people to express their emotions, talk about their thoughts, don't hide them, don't push them down, don't, don't, when you hide them is how they don't heal, how they stay. And when you project them the same way, if you repress them or you project them and blame other people, you keep them. Like a trampoline, isn't it? Yeah. They sit there, you push it they down, they bounce they, out. Yeah, they bounce off, they blast out and the other He said, no, no, it's not going to work that way, but, but expose. So, I actually had a friend in um, China who basically one point wrote to me and he said, oh, your two guidelines, no private thoughts and no people pleasing, he said, I feel they correspond to, to the introduction of A Course in Miracles. I said, what? The introduction? He said, yeah. Nothing real can be threatened, nothing unreal exists, herein lies the peace of God. So Jesus has just given you two guidelines that will help feed you into that state of mind, where you, nothing real can be threatened. Don't worry about these private thoughts that are coming up into awareness, just don't hide them. You know, that's what, remember the Catholic Church, the confessional, you had to go in and tell your sins to a priest? I think that was the original intention was unburden yourself to a priest, which is just a symbol of unburden yourself to the Holy Spirit. You, can, you don't even need a priest to do that if you really are honest with your, with your partner, with your friends, with your family, or maybe even not with them, if maybe you just have a trusted friend who loves you and adores you, and you can tell all your deepest, darkest, private thoughts, and they laugh. They go, ha ha, that's, that's ridiculous. That's not you. Oh, thank you. I needed to have somebody see the truth in me and not tie me into those thoughts, to think that I'm the thinker of those thoughts. You see, that's what heals. So, it's to me... It's a form of ownership, isn't it? Yes. It's like trying to own error when you... Trying to own our feelings. Yes. When you, believe, when you believe they're true and, and they're dark, and you stuff them down... And they're mine. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You get very possessive about them. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. I, I like it. You're really bringing up a good point because, you know, on one hand, people sometimes just say, own the feelings, own the feelings. It's okay if it means don't project the blame onto others, but don't own them in the sense that they, you think that they're you, because that's not it. You've got to forgive them. So I feel like it's, it's more of reel back the projection and quickly give it over to the Holy Spirit. Because if you don't, you'll just, you'll just own it and stuff it. Well, the yeah. ego just stands there, doesn't it? And told yourself, you were so yeah. no good. It was, right. You know. Yeah, it just it pushes down. <coughs> so it's good. We're really getting down to yeah, the so core. No ownership. Give it all, everything away. <laughs> That's right. Give it all away. Give all the private thoughts away. Give everything. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Don't do Tolstoy. Don't, don't do, do what Tolstoy. Tolstoy. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> he said was rich. <laughs> yeah, he gave it to all. He felt so bad about the peasants that he gave it all away. The peasants, and he still felt. Yeah, it's a great story. But he, yeah. still, he probably still held on to the guilt. Exactly. Yeah. It was, it was so that was good because he still held on to the belief in ownership, yeah. even though he gave away the, the, the objects. He didn't yeah. give away the. the the belief, the thought behind it, which is so great. That's so great. Yeah. I'm just gonna say there's ten minutes left. Okay. okay. I'm gonna introduce your book. So just, just so there's ten minutes left. Mm. Ten minutes left. How should we use the final? Oh, that the, 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 the there's. Yeah, we could talk about the monastery, and then I think we even have some books mm -hmm. here. That's what you're bringing up. So, yeah, you want to share anything about the monastery? Else? Yeah. Sure, yeah, I think, um, yeah, we have a monastery in uh, Utah in the United States. Um, 
and we also have actually centers in different parts, uh, in another center in, in the United States and in Cincinnati, and we have a center in Mexico, and we just opened another a new one in Spain, Barcelona, Spain. And they're really just... Australia. Oh yeah, there's one in Australia. Your, your country you came from. <laughs> How quickly they... Oh yeah, Australia. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the center, um, I guess, it's originally just started by a few people um, uh, inspired by David and want to live together to practice this, this um, idea of forgiveness in a daily life together because it's so, you know, it's like we, we go to God through our brothers. So there's so much mirroring going on and there is a lot of support when we come together with a purpose together, same purpose together. And that started that way and the monastery was given, was very guided when it came in, but all the other centers, um, you know, later on came in the same way by, you know, either we were guided to, to, to buy it or even sometimes leasing it, leasing a, a house in Barcelona, for example, right now. And the purpose is, is exactly the same with all the centers across the world, is that we come together and really practice forgiveness 24-7 together. And sometimes people come in just for a short period of time, and sometimes people come for an extended period of time, you know, and um, which both are welcome. So, and we have this, um, we normally encourage people to come to, come to a retreat with us to really allow the mind to absorb um, the context and the metaphysics, the ideas behind what we practice in the daily life. Because there are a lot of practical applications of a very, very deep ideas from, from across the miracles. But um, then people can um, fill in application forms and depending on the location, they can choose which location they want to come and, and uh, we will receive the application and really pray. We'll probably join on a phone call and pray together to see you know, when will be the, the best time and different situations. It's all very individualized. But then I guess the, the thing is that it's all under the control of the Holy Spirit. You know, even when you feel the, the inspiration to question or to come and we feel the, the inspiration to actually invite and we come together, Every encounter is so holy, it's so holy for us. So we really invite people to, to join us in that, in that purpose. You know, it doesn't really matter the amount of time, but it's very, very holy. And we use a lot of practical applications through the, uh, during the time when we're together. So at this point, I think we lay it out as a two week or four week stay to start. So as a start, then after that we can pray together for extended stay. Yeah, it's just you know how Jesus said, "Wherever two or more are gathered in my name, I am there." It's the, the holiness is just the purpose, of, like coming here. You know, we've gathered in a very holy purpose. This is a a holy purpose. It's a it's a good use of time. We're we're using words and time in a very very highly helpful way. Because it's all about freedom, it's all about release, it's all about being guiltless, feeling the joy and the happiness. There's nothing more important, and there's no better use for time than that. It's that same holy feeling. And then, um, and you were mentioning too, we did, we have, have some books over here in, in Ireland, right? That's where yeah. they came from. Yeah. We had some books shipped over, so I did carry in a box, I don't even know what. Yeah, they're on the table. They're back, okay, they're back on the back. So that's, that's what, uh, yeah, our friend Catherine mm. shipped them over. They've been picked up at the postal office and, and brought here, so if anybody wants to spend a little time and look at those too. We also, part of the fun of this has been um, having an experience and then letting the Spirit direct 
how can I make this more available, more uh, relevant, you know, so we have all kinds of stuff on the internet, lots and lots of free audios and writings, videos, and then um, now we're into music, we have a Living Miracle Studio with all kinds of musicians that have collaborated to let the spirit come through. Those, are, there's even like a trust meditation CV, CD that Kirsten and I did. Mm -hmm. Kirsten's new book just came out, which you, Chris was saying she wanted. It. I married a mystic, and I don't know. Did that book make Not it? Not yet, it's, it's but it's still will. over there. It will. I think it will make it to Ireland um, this month. So it's like another distribution center we have is in Ireland for Europe. So it's a cheaper shipping cost. I wanted to buy online because I had the email. But then I look at the shipping price and I'm thinking, oops, I think the yeah. thing that was pushed, pushed to my Yeah, the pushed your way up to get it shipped all the way. But I think there will be a, a group somehow shipped, bulk, ship. bulk shipped over to Ireland. And so I think we have a thing called Living Miracles Europe, probably will be made available, I would think, through that, that website. Yeah, I'm, I'm yeah, sure the it's, it's the D book is available too, so that's a way to do it. And with things like movies, you know, we the spirit has so used movies. I call movies the modern day parables because people love to watch movies. Most people in all the countries I travel to, so we have spiritual interpretations and you might say guidance and um, commentary with the movies. So you can go to our site, mwge.org, which is Movie Watchers Guide to Enlightenment. And now, people are having so much success with that site, that now, you've heard of traditional ways to God, meditation, prayer, service, Mother Teresa and everything. Now, movies have, have broken into the category, and large numbers of people are taking the movie route which is the modern day use of parables with very high instructions and interpretations. So it's oftentimes we will get a group of people and on retreats and everything, we will show movies. I've done like six week retreats in Spain, um, showing movies every night. People spring into high states of mind and even sometimes mystical experiences through the movies. Mm. It's a little different than your ayahuasca, ecstasy, <laughs> uh, meditating 10, 12, 16 hours a day. Just the spirit offering you may want to consider uh, movies as a route. You know, there, you, it, some people may say, well, you know, you're not going to have the same experiences with ayahuasca and David doing movies. Think again. <laughs> Come on and try. You want a non-drug experience of going into this? You know, these are really the spirit using these movies in very direct ways to, to as, as symbols and almost like triggers, but really just a reflections of your own mind's desire to wake up. So, yeah, that's a, I think we're, it's like the fun pathway. I say fun, your emotions, the darkness may still come up during a lot of these movies. So we're not saying that necessarily will, it'll all be, you know, peaches and cream. But what is it over here? Strawberries and cream from Wimbledon. It's not always <laughs> going to be strawberries and, and cream, and, and it's not always going to be the feeling of all you need is love. You may face a lot as you're coming. But in the end, you still hear Jesus singing, let it be. Let it be, let it be, hey, let it be, speaking words of wisdom, let it be. So, with that, it's, it's time to say good afternoon, good evening, and good night. <laughs>